I just felt like my whole, all of a sudden it felt like my heart was beating really high up in my chest is the way I could describe it. Mm. Um, so I had to go and have a lie down and I could just feel my whole body pulsing, but not, okay. in the, not in the kind of boom, 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 boom. It wasn't a real heartbeat. Like it was really irregular. It wasn't that consistent, regular double beat. And I, I had a heart rate monitor strap. I put that on at the time, I remember. <laughs> I guess I was a keen enough runner to yeah. bother doing that. Put that on and my heart rate was registering was like 250. Hello, I'm Sarah. I'm still a pretty average runner, to be honest. I'm trying to get better over every single distance that will have me and just trying to improve day on day. And you lost a minute over 5k the other day. Ooh, it's harsh. gone somewhere. It's disappeared into harsh. the... Uh... It's gone the <laughs> other way, not the good minute. The minute's gone the other early. way. I'm blaming mud. I'm blaming cold. Yeah. And also the fact that I'm not in 5k training. So of course, I'm not going to be in PB shape. Lots of excuses. And I'm Andy Badley, a retired professional athlete from a former life. And now I guess I just talk about running with you guys. And I'm Rick Kelsey. I'm a post-osteotomy patient with a drop foot who's stupidly trying to run faster than he's ever run before. And this is the Running Channel podcast. Yes, and what are we going to be talking about today? We are going to be talking about how you ran in the Olympic final with a heart condition. Yes, it's all about me. It's very exciting. <laughs> it's all about you this <laughs> you week. Came it's up with all this about topic. you. Sarah's idea. But yeah, we should get stuck in and uh, we catch don't need up with our weekend running. You don't need us. You don't need us to no, see. this is just an Andy Bradley monologue. It's not, it's not a monologue. No one Sit wants that. Sit back, relax. Enjoy the flight. <laughs> so, before we get into you, how mm. are you? Before we get into me, how am I? Um, well, we're going to talk about a very specific part of my career, mm -hmm. but right now it's marathon time, very nearly. So, at the point of recording this, it's less than four weeks now until D Day or M Day. Do we call it M Day? Mm. M Day. Does anyone call it M Day? That sounds a bit too cool, but yeah, okay, let's go M Day. Yeah, and, and Sarah accompanied me last week on my long, the longest run I've ever done. Oh. In Rick, in, in my life. You 30... should have seen him. Oh, oh really? <laughs> 32, 32, 32 kilometers, 20 miles. of pure joy watching Andy crumble <laughs> into a shell of him for his former and was self. was he a mess? Did, you, did we film this somewhere? Yeah, yes. of course we filmed of course we, it. Of we film everything. So yeah. I would like to say that, Pete, you've said this to me before. Like, oh, Sarah, well done on your run. It was really hard. But actually, I had to cycle a bike. Or like, oh, Sarah, well done on your yeah. PB. It was really hard. I ran alongside you as well. Yeah. Andy, well done on your long run. Yeah, well done. Thank you. The next time I let you plan a route, <laughs> I am going to double check it for the elevation. <laughs> because, yes, I was on an electric bike. Yes, you but were. But, wow, that electric bike failed me on all the hills. <laughs> yeah, I, can't, I did look at afterwards, and um, it was over 300 metres of elevation. Um, and every single metre, picture me stood up on an electric bike with Tom filming on sat on the back of this bike. Yes, we've got a cargo bike, so it should be enough to carry that kind of uh, cargo if we're going to call it. It's not here, we can call Tom it, the cargo, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone saw just two people in high vis or on a random day on yeah. a bike struggling mm. that was us i mean it was our own fault we didn't pump the tires up enough. Well, i was i was struggling too and you're right i did crumble because i spent the first at least half of the run I felt, and actually beyond 20K, I felt great. And mm. I was chatting away to you guys, making terrible jokes, all of the stuff that you At expect. 20K? Yeah, I think so. I think it's still 20K, it's still quite perky. Yeah. What, and then you just fell off a cliff. 30K, you were a little less perky. I was, I was yeah. swearing and all sorts, I think. <laughs> so we went past two signs. This won't make it into the video because <laughs> no. of what you said. We went past two signs, which were the, you know, the like speed check signs for if you drive into a oh, village yeah, yeah. and it's like, smiley face. Yeah. 10 miles an hour. I was all excited that it was registered earlier in the run, it registered at nine miles an hour. And then mm -hmm. as we were going down this hill towards the end and I'd flagged to the guys, let's film this. It's really cool. I was going along at around 10 miles an hour. And that's what it registered at. Very proud of myself. And then the, the Tom and Sarah cycled ahead of me, sped up down the hill in order to get the right shot. And then obviously the speed camera picked up their speed. So then I was just, I, I like just shout quite abusive. 15 miles an yeah, hour. Yeah. <laughs> but so I said, so Tom, when I'm on the bike, I do whatever Tom says because yeah, like yeah, yeah. to get whatever shot that he needs. And he was like, speed up, speed up. We're going to get this shot. Yeah. And, I, and in my head, I was but bearing in mind, this is like two hours in. I'm yeah. a bit cold. I'm a bit tired. I've worked just as hard as Andy. No, that's not, so that's, was, that's not so true. So I was like, okay, right, we'll cycle ahead. And then I was like, hang on a second. The speed's going to register wrong. And then it was too late. We were already past it. Oh, Whilst no I was idea. shouting into both the GoPro that I was holding and towards them, <laughs> expletives that won't make the cut about how that's only going to be registering your speed, you beep, beep, I beep, had beep. no idea those cameras picked up humans. Yeah. Yeah, they do, yeah. You just got to run in the road. 
No, I was running on the pavement. No. It picks you as long as there's no. There wasn't. It was a really quiet road, so there was no other traffic other than these idiots on a bike. That well, unless it was picking yeah. up because uh, we were matching your speed. Yeah. So then at least it would have registered the right speed. Maybe that you I go. was going that fast, but yes, you're right. I did crumble and just. I guess uh, what was lovely is we on Strava our activities came up as like that we did it together. Yeah. Um, you, yours as a cycle and my, me as a as a run. And I got lots of lovely support on Strava. So those of you that are seeking out those activities and, and kind of getting in touch with me that way, I do really appreciate mm. it. I've been feeling the love. Thank you very much. But also I saw Sarah getting some love. Some people who were like, oh, I can't wait. This is so cool like, that, that it's Sarah riding and Andy Andy running. But there was a few people who were like, Sarah, why weren't you running? <laughs> I was like, honestly, when the day comes that I can bash out 32K in under three hours, yeah. I will let you know, but I am not there yet. Looking forward um, to it. But I, you guys were carrying my water bottle yeah. and I it just i'm just not used to having to worry about i guess you guys as well the idea was i just obviously get on with my run and i don't yeah. think about it mm. but because i was conscious of the route and and you guys on the bike and it is a distraction i was being quite militant with my gels uh but then all of a sudden it was 21k and i hadn't had anything to drink um and that was i suppose better to learn this lesson in your longest run that was yeah. a bit of a disaster and I did start getting cramp from about 24, 25K onwards. I don't know whether it's hydration related. Um, it was definitely fatigue related. Um, and then the only thing that's, I did the 30K a few weeks ago and finished that feeling super confident about the marathon distance. Mm. And then this 32K, I tried to run it a bit quicker. I messed up the hydration um, and I just started to get niggles and they must've been associated with the cramp, but this is the first time I've had recurring knee pain from, from my previous injury for the last five or six K and, and like it just, that's terrified me now with four weeks to go. I'm really yeah. worried about it. So it's um, really not my confidence. I think you've got it. You've got it. It's mm. so like they say in theater, bad dress rehearsal, good performance. Exactly. Oh, that's and he wouldn't that. know anything about theater though. <clears throat> wasn't yeah, really because his forte. Think of it. No, it definitely wasn't. That no. was, you, were the, you were the one man show um, expert at school. I seem yeah. to remember you doing an incredible performance. Yeah, I think performance. I did a, 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 a rendition of Usher. <laughs> yeah, you did. Girl, you make me wanna. Girl, you make me wanna. Yeah, yeah. I remember it vividly. Cartwheels oh, across the stage. I never ever yeah. want to see video evidence of that. Yeah, it probably probably for the best. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> you you're close, and now you get to taper winning. Well, nearly yeah, a couple more weeks, uh, and then it'll be into the true taper, I guess. But it's um made it very very real. I'm really excited to do it, but also now just I know I've been saying I'm nervous, and it might sound like it's nonsense because of the the level that I've competed at. But it's this is a complete unknown for me. And then I'm not helped by the fact that I just got sent by a good friend of mine, actually, a video of um, Adam Kashot, who's a, a Polish retired 800 meter runner. Oh, yeah. Um, running his first ever marathon at the New York Marathon and like uh, broadly collapsing within a few hundred meters of the finish line and, and uh, from fatigue. What, he didn't make it? I think he did cross the line eventually. He got some help from some of the runners that passed oh him, my which is gosh. amazing. But yeah, that didn't, didn't make me feel good hey, about Hey, Andy, my that will make an it. incredible video if that does happen. That was your response, wasn't That's it? When you saw it, it was like, well, if that you, happens to you, Andy, fact, film you, it. You, you failing <laughs> to complete the marathon almost would be a better video. Yeah. Hey guys, no, that's not that's not the uh, the kind of pep talk that I was looking for. It's all right. Try, but at try. least you know. Just either way, best. just yeah. put it on either YouTube. way, whether to support you. <laughs> but yeah, it was too hilly. Messed up my drinks. Yeah. Really nervous. But given we're going to spend the whole episode talking about me and, and heart condition and all that's this true. other stuff, how are you guys? Been yeah. Let's move running? on, Rick. How's your running been? I have. I now understand what a fair weather runner is. <laughs> is that you? The weather was apocalyptic at the weekend mm, and yeah. you know it's it's 7 30 you've been up for an hour with the kids you're like oh, an hour and a half to park run uh should i do it yeah oh it's eight o'clock probably still gonna do it 8 30 well i gotta make a decision now went out went out under 100 runners really oh, wow. and it's usually a under there, right? 100 so runners. was it raining or was it just boggy it was absolutely chucking it down under really? 100 and so if you think about that and, and my park run averages just under 200 normally so does that mean, <laughs> question, 50, 50. that 50% 50 of runners are fair weather runners? Well, well, you say that. I did a park run this weekend. I think there was something like 800, no, maybe 500 people running. Big wow, park run. Yeah, it's a big one, yeah. And I always look at like all of the information afterwards and there was a good like 100 first timers there. And I was like, that is even more impressive. Yeah. If, or maybe the beauty of like being naive to the whole thing. If your first park run is because it was boggy, like it was proper kind of cross country running. Mm. So if that was your first park run and you're like, oh my gosh, it's a 5K every Saturday morning going to be this muddy. 
No, but probably yes until about March in the UK. Yeah, it is. Once it gets wet, it doesn't really dry out, does it? No. But how many do you normally get on a Saturday at your park run? Good, like 800 yeah. to 1,000. Okay, 1, so you, so you lost 30%. Yeah. We lost I, I think that stati- by, by the same rules of statistics that you've just thrown at me there, that your, your sample of one, that yeah. 50% <laughs> of the people have shown up when it was raining. Yeah. I would say that Sarah's roughly four times pop- as popular as you. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if her park run's getting 800 people and yours only get 200 i think that's just it's oh sarah, sarah advertises her park run i didn't i don't say where mine is <laughs> i like it i like it to stay small <laughs> it's a secret it's a secret hey if you want to come to clapham common it's yeah. a great party round oh so how yeah. did you get on then oh so i decided this weekend that i was going to have a bash at some faster runs so saturday i was like right clapham common park run it's pretty muddy. Yeah. I'm just going to go out, not look at my watch because pace will mean nothing. Just go out hard. And I went out pretty hard. And then whatever, it's a two lap. And I was like, right, okay, when I get onto the concrete, because it's half mud, half concrete, whatever pace I'm doing then, I'm just going to stick at it and like put more effort in to sustain whatever that pace feels like. Yeah. And I did pretty perfectly even splits, despite the fact that I wasn't looking at my watch. However, like... Two, three months ago, those splits would have been around about 30 to 40 seconds quicker per one. So I, I made... Per kilometre? Per kilometre. Yeah. You lost, two, you lost two and a half minutes. Yeah. yeah. Where is it? Really? So it's, so in in like, it's in Clapham somewhere. It's just in the ether. No, it's in... So my PB is in Victoria Park. Okay. So there's a question around GPS accuracy okay, so on you, that one. So you were running four minutes, know, 50 a kilometre. Mud's easily No, worth. so... Yeah, I was doing like 445, 445 per kilometre. Kilometer. Okay. I think I did one that was 453. That was, you know, kilometre four, slightly losing the will to live. Mm-hmm. Unsure where the finish was. I'd say mud's easily worth 30 seconds a kilometre if it's that bad. Okay, great. So if I've it's as bad as it. you've been going on about it anyway. You know, yeah, exactly. You made it, it was, sound like it was... If it's think, quagmire. It yeah. wasn't... So <laughs> it was muddy, but it was also <laughs> the fact that a lot of people hadn't put on trail shoes yes. and didn't want to run through puddles. Yeah. Although I was listening to oh, another... Adding distance. Yes. Yeah, so, no, cutting distance Cutting off. distance. So Super you go cool. under the trees, like through all of the yourself. mud, and yep. then all of the people were going onto the grass. Uh, and I was like, one, you're going to ruin the grass. Two, well, just get in the mud, jump in a puddle. Yeah. No, I'm with you. Get in the mud, jump in the puddle. However, that 10K that we all did recently down in the New Forest, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. there was an option of routes that you could take as a runner. Oh, as you went through it across a, a, a ford, went through basically. A ford. Yeah. So you could, you could take the dry route or the wet route. Yeah. And it's like, so you could go up and over a bridge over this, the yeah. river, all Ooh, the way before, or you could go down. Yeah, I but mean, it was a tiny thing, but. Uh, well, it's not when you're absolutely knackered. Personally, yeah, I it, would always vote go through the mud. I agree. And I heard I someone agree. else actually saying like, if you're doing a proper like trail race in the mm. mountains, please go through. Mm. If it's like a bog or a puddle, go through the puddle because um, if you go on the dry bits, you're just eventually eroding just more and making yeah. the yeah. puddle bigger. Well, th- there's, a lot of, footprints. there's a lot of yeah. choices you've got to make about what you've got to go through in life. And one thing <laughs> that Andy had to go through in life was an Olympic final with a heart condition. Oh, the segue. Oh, we're just on that segue, Rick, because that was so polished and professional. I've got one little note that I had for the podcast today. Oh, which yeah, is, as I was leaving the house this morning, my lovely mother-in-law came to help with the children today and, and various like childcare and so on. Yeah, it's a and busy day for her. She asked, she is, yeah, there's so many of them. <laughs> and she, um, she was just had one of those yeah. number <laughs> clickers click to get in, all the kids in, onto in. She's putting one them all in there for recent 25, tablets. 26, 26 27. 27. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. See, this leads Out. very nicely into what she said to me. I said, oh, she said, what have you got on the schedule today? I said, oh, I'm recording the podcast. I'm really excited mm. about that. And she just said, apropos of nothing, leave poor Rick alone. I think he's done really well. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm gonna buy her a new clicker. So I thought, one, she definitely doesn't listen to enough of the podcast because I feel like I'm the one that gets the abuse all of the time. And two, I don't know what she's on about. You have not done really well at anything. No, I'm joking. Hey. <laughs> he's, at it, he's at it again. Oh, all right, come on. Let, I'm clearly joking. Enough of that. On with your heart condition. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What do you want to know? I guess so. This is this for, for context. Yeah, I did run and still have a, a an ongoing heart condition. That, that only came to light because I was competing. Um, and I was lucky enough to have the support of the British Olympic Association, my kind of medical insurance and um, CRY, the, the charity that supports young people, which I don't think I'd qualify for anymore, but with, with heart conditions to try and make sure you get the right diagnosis so that you know that you can exercise healthily. So I had to go through that process actually. So I had, when it first happened, I had to 
stop running for a couple of months other than under these controlled circumstances uh, where they were like strapping electrodes to my chest and all that sort of stuff to, to read the ECG, ECG readings to, to work out what the problem was and then give me the kind of all clear to compete. So let's start right back before you knew you had it. What yeah. were the kind of first signs of this condition? I definitely had an episode when I was at university uh, in my first or second year where I just felt like my whole, all of a sudden it felt like my heart was beating really high up in my chest is the, the way I could describe it. Mm. Um, but then it, it felt like my whole body was beating. Um, so it was, it was heart palpitations basically. Um, so I had to go and have a lie down and I could just feel my whole body pulsing, but not, okay. in, the, not in the kind of boom, 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 boom. Like yeah, classic and it, it, it wasn't like you'd had a night on the Gavi. It was like, <laughs> no. you know, it was no. something that <laughs> felt oh, serious. And, and another little aside there for you, Rick, you'll like this very much. So behind the scenes at the Running Channel, another little anecdote this morning from Elliot at the Running Channel. He just goes, Elliot, he bought his mum a, a bottle of Gavi as a gift and she, <laughs> and she, and she loved it. Oh so. gosh, it's going around. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but uh, no, it wasn't alcohol related, yeah. um, despite being at university. Um, and it, it wasn't a real heartbeat. Like it was really irregular. It wasn't that consistent, regular double beat. It was, it was really uh, irregular. And I, I had a heart rate monitor strap. I put that on at the time. I remember, <laughs> I guess I was a keen enough runner to yeah. bother doing that. Put that on and my heart rate was registering was like 250 um, because it wasn't a real regular rhythm. Um, and then it, uh, I think I, I spoke to a doctor and, and um, but then it subsided and then it didn't happen again for another couple of years. That was it. And so at that point, I had a few tests done, but nothing, nothing massive. And right. did it happen when you were like, did it happen during a track session? No, that was just literally, I think I'd stood up from dinner. Like it wasn't a, um, I would say it wasn't sport related <laughs> at that. that point. Yeah. Training yeah, yeah. for the Olympics. Yeah. Yeah. When did you notice just stood up? <laughs> Honestly, this was, this was the yeah, first, first or second year at university when I was a good runner, but not that serious and hadn't achieved you know, yeah. particularly fast things. And then in my, it was in my final year at university when Andy, who ended up coaching me throughout my whole career had started coaching me. Uh, I remember going to a track session with him over at the Luton track, I think. Um, and there was two of us training together, or three of us. And I got halfway around a, a rep and just felt like I was going to pass out. Um, and I could feel this tightness in my chest and my like left arm, you know, kind of classic, what I understand would be heart attack type symptoms. Well, wow, that's mm -hmm. scary. Uh, it was scary, yeah. And then I stopped running and lay down on the track, trying to get it kind of under control with my breathing yeah. or whatever. Um, and it was still still going and I could again I felt really lightheaded, very weak because the heartbeats themselves weren't doing what they needed to do, which is getting yeah. enough blood and oxygen around my body. And then Andy came running up to me and he's like, You're right, you're right, is it your legs? Is it like he thought I'd pull the hamstring or something? And I was like, No, no, it's my heart. And he's like, Oh, okay then. <laughs> <laughs> he, I think he was relieved that it was my heart, not that I'd like pull the so muscle. Did you go to hospital? Yeah, I did. I went to hospital. But by the time I got there and got through the triage and all that sort of stuff, um the it returned to normal and they couldn't catch anything on their machines. Um, Which is why you got the matchbox inserted in under your skin. Yeah, so Rick has some insider knowledge here. Yeah. Sarah didn't know me when this was a this was a thing. But yes, I had a I went through a whole battery of tests again at yeah. the Olympic Institute where they couldn't replicate it. But in order to be able to kind of give me the all clear to just train, tell them to uh, give you a plate of dinner, just ask you to stand yeah, up. Yeah, just stand up. That's <laughs> yeah. awesome. That'd be enough now. That would be enough nowadays. Um so then, yeah, I had to run on the treadmill in all these different conditions with different electrodes on and stuff and, and nothing would do it. So then they ended up going for this uh, implant, implant called a reveal device, which was uh, implanted underneath my skin in my chest, like just underneath my collarbone. And um, that it wasn't, it didn't have any wires or anything in it. It was a totally self-contained little, I've actually still got it somewhere, um, little USB stick it looked like. Um, and then that could record my heartbeat. Um, and it was recording it constantly, but it would just delete itself every 12 hours or whatever. Okay, but you had that in for years, didn't you? Yeah, I did. And I had a separate little clicker for it where if I had an episode, I pressed that clicker and then it would save the previous 30 minutes of, of, oh, I of see. Like, so recording. It, so, so you then had an episode and then clicked it. Yeah, so then and it, you it, then it the would save that as a file. I see. And then I could go into the hospital and they would put this little pad on my chest to read the data. And then mm. the cardiologist could see that the rhythm that was traced out by my Okay, so what, what did that rhythm show? So it showed that I had something called um, AV node reentrant tachycardia. Yes. So no one's going to remember that. No, it's hard enough for me to remember it just now. AV node, so the, the atrium and the ventricle are the two parts of the heart. Right. So the node between them is called the AV node. And that broadly, like it's an electrical conductor that tells each half of the heart to beat when it should. So it goes boom, 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 boom. Okay. That's the two halves of the heart beating. Um and that should work like a one-way street. So it should be electrical impulses going from one to the other saying, this half has had a beat, this one should now beat. 
and then it repeats itself. Mm -hmm. But mine works like a roundabout under certain conditions. So the electrical impulses kind of go back on themselves and tell the first half of the heart to beat when the second one is still beating. And so then you get this kind of blah, 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 like really irregular heartbeat. That's exactly what it sounded like, by the way. Right. That was, a, uh, that was a, an expert recreation. But only at times, not at all times, yeah. just at certain moments. And it would yeah. often be times when I was run down or stressed. Interesting. Um, okay. Nervous. I was nervous a lot for races and things like that. Um, and then from that diagnosis, I was told that there were various different options, which was ablation. So they, they could laser ablate part of the heart tissue to like burn it away basically to stop yeah. the conducting but that's has a risk because if they ablate the wrong part of your heart then you need a pacemaker um or you can take drugs which you don't want to do because there's all sorts of stuff on the ban list um or just carry on as long as it's not life threatening which they said it wasn't um and it wasn't changing my quality of life which again it wasn't because okay. even during the height of my career it was probably only a few episodes every few months okay um, so you went for option c yes do nothing and just okay. crack on and, um, and when did you have the matchbox slash xylophone removed from your chest? I think we might have talked about this on the podcast as being a classic Andy move, which was that like I didn't I have it. I had like two or three year battery life, this thing. And I had it in for about 10 years. Um, oh, my God. Because yeah, yeah. it got to the end of every season and you'd finish the season in. Oh, I would finish the season usually mid-September, that kind of time yeah. after championships, Olympics, world champs. And then you'd ha I'd only have two weeks off. And then I'd want to start building back up again for the cross country season. And so every year I was like, by the time I'd think about doing yeah. it, you then hit a waiting list and, and then you'd get maybe an I appointment see. for like January, which was, I was, would have been back fully into But you've been again. with Louise since you were a teenager. So it's not like anyone else is going to see it. Hey, I think she quite liked it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I've got absolutely no idea whether she did. Um, How big was it? Did it like, it, it was, it was if like, you were wearing a t-shirt, did it just look like you had a weird, yeah. like pin badge on the I, I remember just, I remember always, T tapping it just checking yes, it was you did. still <laughs> working i love that mate that was really nice of you no worries um, yeah. um still working it, yep yeah still in there? it was about the size of a, a um what i would think of as traditional old school usb dongle or usb stick that you would stick into the side of a See, computer i as a child had a usb stick because yeah. you had to for itc yeah i had a floppy ICT? disk itc what are them Internet, ICT, i think ict internet uh, inf inf in hmm. Something in communication technology, right? And my USB stick was in the shape of a VW Beetle, so um, I'm guessing it wasn't quite like that. No, it was the it was your classic. It looked like a, a, a what I would think of a standard sized eraser that you used. At yes, school. pencil eraser. A what? A rubber. A rubber. What? Don't you just use an iPad? Oh, stop oh. it! You're, no, 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 I'm, no, joking. no, I'm not having this. I'm, I'm having joking. This. Don't worry. I've yeah, got the Yeah, we were pen chiseling license. into our, our clay tablets yeah. when we were uh, at school, <laughs> or uh, a different kind of tablet, <laughs> just <laughs> slate <laughs> with chalk. Nice. Just carving the wood. So you had that. So you've been retired a couple of years now. Yeah. Did you have that taken out since you retired? Yes. You had that taken out. Right? Imagine if he still had it in. I know. Nope. I've got still it on though. the Should I bring it in on the show? Yeah, podcast maybe bring show it in. Show yeah, it yeah bring it in. Cleaner, yeah. yeah, did you clean it? Mm, yeah. No, I don't I don't really. Yeah, I must have. They must have cleaned it. It must have been sterile so in some way. Was it a, was oh, it general okay. anesthetic to say, take it out? No, it was local. Local. Um, it wasn't that sort of deeply inserted. But yeah, right. I guess the point here is... Um, I've had loads of athletes get in touch with me over the last 10 years because I'd had this experience and it is fairly terrifying. Like it's, it, it, it was a brief period where I thought like this thing that I loved was going to get taken away from me completely mm. so that I wouldn't. And, and, and it, this happened when I was just trying to break through into the, the ideas of making international teams, let alone this idea of going to the Olympics. But yes, mm. I did end up running in the Olympic final, world champs final, Europeans, Commonwealths with this thing in my chest. Um, and was it when you got to a stage of competition like that, you're literally on a world stage. Mm. Was it still like at the forefront of your mind? Like, did you just have every single competition you went to where you're like, right, if this happens, this is the protocol? No, I, I hardly thought about it at all. But then I used to get reminded, reminded about it by journalists. And it's interesting, I think, the, the role that stuff like that can play inadvertently in your psychology. Oh, I see. Like people ask something that it's quite a nice question. And you oh, weren't worried, but then you become yeah, worried. Yeah, yeah. So like, they're like, yeah. how's that thing? That you've done your best to put to the back of your mind, and for then six you're just years. like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then your heart can start going. And he's, so some yeah. of it's psychosomatic, I think. But mm. um, hopefully, it's you know, it, it's been something that I've managed yeah. to come through both psychologically and have the assurance from medical professionals that I can carry on. Um, but also, it's, it highlights the importance of getting checked out when you have any kind of unusual symptoms when you're running. Yeah, well, the best thing is just to be safe and like yeah. get the advice. Ultimately, you didn't 
you chose to do nothing, but you had that choice, which is the main thing. Yeah, rather it was, than it just was like inf- ignoring the problem. It was an informed medical choice. Yeah. And and also it I'd hope shows that like the I actually don't think of it as as being massive adversity that I necessarily had to deal with. But when I speak to people about it, they they either took inspiration from it or um just were interested in that challenge that you might face. Mm. So something unusual, an unusual one. And uh definitely got pictures and and the actual thing that I could bring in and show people. So I have two more questions. Yeah. One, did it ever happen within a competition? No. And two, does it still happen now? Or maybe like once a year, I might get a very small symptom, but I, I can, there's something called, I think it's called the Valsalvo maneuver where you can, um, I could have that wrong, but where you, you compress your own chest by essentially breathing in. And then imagine squ- using that extra kind of pressure in your chest cavity to squeeze all of your organs. Um, just, just by breathing. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's all, yeah, Sarah's pulling that face. Rick and, Rick and Sarah both pulling the face that you would pull when you try and do it. And that can, that You're quite Trying successful. to hug yourself. Uh, but no, but just yeah. using using the pressure of the air inside your lungs to okay. to squeeze your, your organs almost. Right. So it is kind of that, like, yeah, almost like trying to go to the toilet, I suppose, that kind of pressure. Um, <laughs> but then that, that would, can sometimes, it has worked quite successfully to me to reset the rhythm. So if we see you pulling that face in Valencia. Then I'm either doing a poo. You're not about to poo yourself. Like yeah. One or it's, yeah, one it's a 50-50 chance. Yeah. Right, okay, yeah. good. And good. thanks for answering Sarah's two questions in rapid fashion. Thanks, Andy. This is the Ronnie Channel podcast. Up next, we've got new stories to discuss. Plus, it's almost time for our favourite bit, answering your questions. Okay, news time. New York. New York, New York. Yes, it's another major marathon. So it's, uh, I know Valencia, which I'm doing, is basically the end of the autumn winter marathons. But New York's obviously a pretty big pinnacle. Oh, and it looked so good at the weekend. Two of our own were out there. Anna was there supporting. And Mo ran New York Marathon. Yeah, just cruised well around it with a friend, I think. Yeah, excellent work. Well done, Mo. Yeah, um, there were some course records, I think, in the men's race as well. Mm-hmm. So the course records, because it's a tradition, I think the course record now stands at 204 or something. Yes. And you compare that to Kiptum's um, now two under 201 for his yeah. world record. Like that shows how tough the course is. And I, I've been there supporting New York Marathon and run the the last section in, in Central Park. And that is rolling constantly. So it's, oh, it's okay. a tough finish. Marathon. So it basically yeah, it it's hilly. hilly. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. hilly. But well done to everyone that took part. Yes, it, we'd love to hear your story. So email in at podcast at the running channel.com if you've got anything interesting to tell us uh, from your race experiences. And now time for your questions. Rick. Hi, this is where I get to talk out loud. <laughs> 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 but only after you've uh, very pointedly waited for Sarah to introduce you. <laughs> <laughs> she does that nowadays. Um, <laughs> Chase from Columbia, Tennessee, USA. Thank you, Ooh, Chase. Oh, Thank I love you. this. Yeah. This is just straight down the barrel of a question so yep. brace sentence. yourselves you Boom. two yeah how do you train to go deeper into the pain cave slash red line when running oh, i need this i mean andy how do you do it um i think so this is i bang on about it but it's one of the things that sets often sets the elite athletes apart from from non-elites it is that the, the you get a lot of people i've always had people come up to me and say oh it's easy for you you're fast like it's, oh, e- it's easy for you you're a faster yeah. runner and i my i wouldn't necessarily always be as stark as this but i'm always like well i don't think it is like it's it's easier for me to run fast but i would argue that and this is always something that's fascinated me i'd love to be able to be inside someone else's body or head yeah and mm. feel and experience exactly what they feel because you never can right you've got no idea what you're but i think what i think of as my 10 out of 10 effort is quite likely to be harder than what Sarah thinks of as her 10 out of 10 effort. Yeah. Because I, I have had more experience of going to my literal point of exhaustion, collapsing afterwards, being sick, like like getting to yeah. a, having to an abandon a, a training session halfway through because I've gone too hard too early and I've literally got nothing left. Because it's your life. This is what exactly this yeah, is what I think yeah. the yeah. difference is though, is that I think people who have found it have like quote unquote failed on the way to finding yes. it. So I think that is, that for me is like, I think I am one step closer because I've tried to find it and haven't Mm. found it yet. So I would actually say like a great way to train to go deeper is to put yourself in a situation where if you're fearing like, oh, I might not be able to finish the session or I might not be able to get back to my house by the end of this run, like going actually going to a track and not giving yourself the option to not finish the rest of it, but just experimenting with like, can you actually complete this session? Yeah. Like will help yeah. you find that red line. Yeah. Do a session that you've done before 
um, it doesn't matter what distance you're training for and repeat it. Same recoveries, but then either do it in two ways, just fractionally increase the pace of each of the efforts and then just do that workout. And if you get to say 80, 90% of it and you kind of almost having to like take an extra recovery or, or abandon altogether, then your body's learned something and you found you're much closer to finding that red line. And the mm -hmm. reason I'm saying do something you've done before and only increase it a fractional percent is you're not looking to leap and double what you do or make it twice as hard or anything. That's just stupid and you will get hurt. So yeah. you don't want to like- Incremental gains. Exactly, it's, in, it's incremental. Or, Choking it. Yes, breaking it down into steps to see if you can get closer yeah. to that red yeah. line. Or if you've got, say it's eight by a K or it doesn't actually matter what the workout is. Pick in that specific session, I'm giving it as an example, yeah. pick the sixth or the seventh effort. So do all of them at the same pace as you've completed that session at before. Pick the sixth or the seventh effort and go really hard. Mm. Like, like, you know, a significant, like just what feels like flat out. Not yeah. like sprinting flat out, but flat mm. out for a kilometer. And, and, and then see if you can finish the session. So see if you can do the seventh and eighth rep or the eighth rep, depending on which one you've gone really hard at. Because that's and, also the moment in a race where you need to like... Exactly. That's the, the most yeah. amount of effort you, you need in a race. You can simulate it. And every time that I've done that, and my coach has forced me to do that in the past, I don't feel like I can do it. And then he gets me to do the sixth effort out of eight, much harder than I really want to or think I can do. I finish it, take the same recoveries I've taken before, maybe slightly longer. And then I finish reps seven and eight at the same pace that I did reps one to five. And mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, there was more in the tank and I didn't know. And you can't find it by doing it on the last rep. So that's no. cheating. You've got yeah, to do you it to, where you've still you got some the workout to do. Yeah, Sneakily it. unlock yeah. it. Yeah, uh, it's a good one. Real good one. Right, moving on to Dave from Pembrokeshire. I've seen my incredible wife do regular half marathons. And recently she did astonishingly well and smashed the London Marathon too. I'm having trouble seeing a half as an accomplishment. More like something I should be able to do. So the marathon is alluring me like a cruel siren. Fantastic, oh, I feel your pain, Dave. Dave. Yeah. I don't know whether mine was alluring, but I've been forced into it, so I'm with you. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> my only issue is I'm not really enjoying the long runs of my half training. I thoroughly enjoy getting out anything up to nine miles, and my sprints are fun too, but I'm finding the last few runs of 11 and 12 a bit of a slog. How can I get through it? I, you, need Sarah, you need Sarah out on the bike with giving you absolutely yeah. zero personality or banter. <laughs> 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 That's what I had for 21k. Hey, I had Tom on the back of my bike giving me absolutely zero personality yeah, or true, banter. Yeah, I, it was, I was just passed Yeah, on. I was chatting away to you guys and getting nothing in return. Isn't this funny? Isn't this beautiful? These are the fields that I like to stop and stare at. And I uh, got nothing. Oh, yeah, I saw them right. They're actually pretty good. Oh, yeah? The fields, yeah. Beautiful. 10 out of 10 oh, fields. Oh, beautiful. It's good to know what he's talking about. So yeah. essentially, Dave is talking about you know, uh, is a full marathon a stupid idea for him then? Here's what I think is going to happen, Dave. I think you're going to start training for a full marathon and run, you know, 15, 16 miles in training. And then you're going to fondly look back on those 11 and 12 miles runs that you currently hate. Mm. That's personally yeah. what, what I found. I think you need to start to, what can you do to those 11 and 12 miles runs to make them a little bit more fun? Can you listen to a good podcast, plan a good route, switch it up a little bit? Switch Is it, it the fact that routes. you're yeah. yeah, you're doing one pace the whole time? Could you throw in a bit of, you know, easy 2K, then do a couple of K, which is a bit yeah. harder. Mix it up a little bit. But Go with someone else? Go with someone else. Go yeah. with your wife. I totally get this, though. The psychology of, like, seeing his amazing wife do, do, do these things and making them look easy. Like, uh, mm. as much as we joke, that's what I'm surrounded by at the running channel. And you guys have been knocking out marathons for fun. And then I start yeah. to think less of what I might go and achieve because you guys seem to find it so easy that yeah, I, I, yeah, I totally get yeah. it. it. It takes away the, he's like, would have seen the half as like this big challenge. And then now because he knows people doing full marathons, it's it's yeah. like, it's it's different. Um, but I'm totally with Sarah. I think even we'll listen, we should listen back to episodes of this podcast before I started the proper marathon block. The idea of those long runs was, it's still I still don't like them. But I am looking back on those 11, 12 mile runs and being like, oh, that, that, like I get to that point now in my long runs and that, that, that I don't even think about that point. I'm just thinking about once it gets hard later on. Mm. But that only happens through this incremental progress over like week on week, just doing a little bit more yeah. um, and not really thinking too far ahead. Yeah. And there's a guy in our office who just like knocks out a marathon before breakfast. So I understand what that you're coming in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> it's absolutely not me. <laughs> it's not me either. But yeah, I feel like it doesn't, 
you're not going to enjoy every section of every run is what I would say. Yeah. Like I, I used to, when I was like in marathon training, even when I was in 5k training, cause I was trying to maintain fitness every single Sunday, I would do 10 miles, but like granted if I was yeah. okay. Yesterday I went out and I'm trying to build mileage back up again after Chicago. And I did 13 and a half kilometers. And I was so happy with that yeah. because like that is the longest I've run in a few weeks. And I was like, okay, that actually feels really good. That mm. is like eight, almost nine miles. You yeah, can't I do the maths. <laughs> but like, I think you have to put it into context. And also whatever you do, that is the first time that you've done that. Doesn't matter yeah. what anyone else has done. If you run a marathon, you're still in the 1% club. You know what? You're right, run. exactly. And be grateful you've got the time. I have two children under three. There is no way I have time to run 12 miles <laughs> on a Sunday. You, you, just <laughs> keep flying, you keep flying your in-laws over to do childcare, mate. You, you don't, don't give me this. It's, it's oh, quite my, expensive childcare, that one. <laughs> <laughs> i tell so you hard. what, Dave. Dedicate miles 11 and 12 to Rick. Oh, thanks, Dave. <laughs> yeah, because tell in, us how you're getting on. Yeah. In, because in the words of uh, my mother-in-law, he's doing really well. He oh. is doing really what's, well. What's her name? Uh, Anne. Anne. Yes. Anne, thank you so much. A lot of love goes oh, out to you no, this week. I we'll see. You, we'll, we'll see you next week. But before we go, Sarah's got a favour to us. I have got a favour to us. <laughs> What's it going to be this time? This time, because we haven't plugged it yet, I would like every single person watching, listening, however you digest your podcast, to email into podcast at the dot com with a question that you don't think we know the answer to, Ooh. and Andy will research it. <laughs> well, it's a good job I'll be the one researching it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, as long as it's not to do with maths or percentages or yeah. running, I'll, I'll, I'll be all over it. Yeah, 50% of the time, Sarah is right every time. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Just trying to work Don't even out. understand that <laughs> yeah, joke. Yeah. But anyway, we'll be back next week. Email in podcast at the and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.